Old Man Sarge here, back again. Uh, Going to do some gameplay uh, video on a, a game that I really enjoy. Um, it's basically kind of a historical game. It's called Britannia. This is uh, not the original one uh, that I played a long time ago. I think I still have that one. This is a uh, is a remake, and. Uh, but it's really good still. Fantasy Flight puts this one out, or did. I don't know if it's still out or not. But basically you can see the very front of the of the cover of the game really tells you what it's all about. Invading Romans, Vikings. It's essentially a game about the invasion of Britain. There's actually two more uh, of these guys that go out. but. So you got these different uh, different cultures that were in Britain before the Romans invaded. Those represent the blue on the very bottom portion. Represent the Belgea, which I believe is where Belgium, the word Belgium, comes from, but I could be wrong. And then you've got the Welsh who of course are in Wales and Cornwall, a portion of England and uh, there's the Welsh and then you have the Brigantes Brigantes, you know Central England the Picts up in the north where the Scottish are right now and the Caledonians at the very northern tip of Scotland and then of course the Romans are invading I'll go briefly over with how the rules work, explain them to you, and then uh, we'll just start the gameplay so you can see kind of how it flows. But the whole point of the game is to try to obtain as many victory points as possible. And to do that, you on these very on these cards, it indicates at specific turns what territories you want to hold for uh, getting victory points or if you kill Roman armies or whatever. It kind of like really flows with uh, determining kind of how that particular culture will maximize the victory points for your color. So and it can play up to four people. There's also a, a, a one for um, Italy which I'll play at an, another game another game in the future. And then there's also one that someone put out for Spain, which I got a hold of, um, which is not like this. It's actually made in the similar field or the similar uh, theme, but it's for it's for basically the history of Spain. So I will return, and we will discuss some of the rules. All right. So here's the rule book. It's fairly it's a fairly simple game. There are some rules that break the general specific rules in the game. Uh, first thing is you have population track for most nations. Uh, the Romans, for example, don't have that. And once you reach a certain level of population, one more, if you go one more over with this dial, then you generate an additional population, which then you can place on the board. These don't represent necessarily military units, they represent military, population, influence, things like that. Culture, ethnicity, <clears throat> that's, what they, what, that's what they represent. There are some units on the board that are going to be cavalry. There are going to be leaders, like here, for example, is Boudicca. Boudicca was a famous uh, uh, Belgea. Uh, princess or queen, I guess, and uh, she fought against the Romans. She actually rebelled against them because once her uh, father died, who was the king, he um, he gave the kingdom to her. But according to Rome, it should have been theirs. Um. So the victory point markers. These are all components in the game. There are forts. And then of course here's our here's the game setup. The rule book's actually really good. Um, 
So you want to try to get as many uh, victory points as you can. It requires you to either kill other people's uh, pieces or to occupy uh, terrain zones at the end of specific turns. The game round has different phases. Population increase, movement, the battle, raider withdraws and overpopulation. And then the end of the game round you have scoring and then you can either elect the king potentially in the future, Bre uh, Breitwalda or the king itself. So in a moment we'll go over how the population increase works. So population increase. Uh, besides the Romans and the very end of the game I believe there are a couple other nations that I think the Norwegians and the Normans don't have uh, population gains. They have special rules. But everyone else they get two points per regular uh, territory. And one point <coughs> for difficult terrain. So this would be like if you just had these two, it'd be three points. Um, now, so if every six points you have, so two, four, six, would be one population. And any remainders left over are calculated through here. So if you had five, you or like let's say you had seven, you would get one troop and then you'd get one population point here. And that's basically how the population works. Um, simple. Now we'll go over to the next one, which is movement. Alright, <clears throat> for movement, there is it's basically <clears throat> Hold on one second. All right. Movement, uh, basically, every normal army can move two spaces, as it says right here. Except for cavalry and Roman armies, they move three. And if you enter, um, if you enter a difficult terrain place, like the Downlands or Lindsay, or, you know, Gwent, Gwent or whatever, you have to stop. Also, if you use... Uh, if you use uh, one of these straights, you pretty much have to stop. But there are special special rules in the game which allow you to continue to move. For example, <clears throat> there are leaders like Boudicca, which if she was with this army, she could actually move through the downlands. She can move three spaces, so it would be two. I think she has to spend an additional one point here. I could be wrong. Pardon me for my camera. And then move to here if she wanted to. So leaders can break the rules. Um, Alright, <clears throat> so that's movement. Stacking limits. You can have no more than three troops in an, in an area. So like this would be your stacking limit. Or two in a um, or two in a difficult piece of terrain. <clears throat> and if you're overstacked then you'll have additional pieces uh, removed. Also movement, there's something called overruns, which if you outnumber your opponent two to one, then you could move the ne next guy through, as an example. Um, and then there's uh, sea, or invasions from the sea, which we'll talk about later. Boat movement allows you to move <clears throat> from one territory to, to another. So if this guy had boat movement in the North Sea, he could move up to here, for example, as his movement. Um, then there's invasions and raiding. So you could actually in, do invasions, which have special rules, which we'll go over in just a moment, and raiding, which means that you don't even have to like necessarily stay, stay on the land. You can actually come back to the ocean or to the sea. So we'll be right back and we'll talk about invasions and how they work. Alright, so when we're talking about invasions, there are two kinds. And they're listed actually 
on the cards themselves. So I'll zoom in. Now on this card for the for the Romans it says invaders, major invasion. Uh, if we look at the angles, invaders raiding, invaders raiding, invaders raiding, invaders raiding. They're just regular invasions. So the difference between a major invasion and a regular invasion is on a regular on a major invasion, the phasing nation, which in this case would be Rome, can attack, <clears throat> move, attack, and then move and attack again. So it's like a blitz, kind of. They can really push right into, uh, into England. There's not many countries that I think have major invasions. Like I'm looking at the Danes. And then I'll look at you look at the Scots, they might have it. No, it looks like just most I think most everybody is just well, the Norwegians which come in late in the game. They have right here major invasion. So there are some nations that have it, so they get to attack and then move and attack again. But most other nations have multiple invasions. So like the Saxons, they invade on multiple turns. They just keep coming in. <clears throat> also, interesting thing about victory points is if you look here, it tells you that on turn 5, each English area south of Cheshire, okay, and then on turn seven, it tells you how many victory points. So it's really, you know, you really want to have Essex, right? So if you're if you're the uh, the Saxons, this is one of the territories they're trying to get a hold of right there because it's worth quite a bit of victory points. Then there are these things that happen um, on certain turns, like here, any round, each Roman army destroyed is two victory points. Each Roman fort is six. They get quite a bit for going after the Romans. If they can kill these leaders, they get six points per leader. Um, and the Saxons, because they were around for quite a while, there are things like uh, Arthur, Avar, Harold, Haralda, William, Svein, uh, Erickson, Erithson. So <clears throat> there's quite a bit of victory points that are associated, as we discussed prior. Um, so that's invasions. So now we will talk about uh, raiding. Will be the next thing that we'll discuss. That's a little bit, uh, a little bit more in depth. Well, not in depth, but just a little bit different. So on raiding, the Irish are an example of a raiding army, and I believe the Danes. The Danes are also kind of a, a raiding army. And it represents the, the forces coming in to different parts of England and not staying. Like the Irish came from, of course, Ireland. They raided part of Wales and some other areas. <clears throat> when they succeeded in their raids, they went back to Ireland. They didn't stick around. They didn't settle in the area. Well, the Irish have an option. <clears throat> they can either be an invader or a raider. So all the difference between the two is the raider can attack and then go back into the ocean so they can't be attacked on the other player turn. And then that kind of goes coincides with these different uh, benefits like each enemy force destroyed from turns three to set six for the Irish gains two victory points. Each Roman fort gains two victory points. <clears throat> so the benefit of, of raiding and attacking and then leaving is that uh, your forces, you can c accumulate them for a better landfall in the future. Of course, that means that you have to survive the raid. Um, and then some other nations get to raid, like for example the Picts. They will get to raid as well. Uh, even though they start already on the map. I think they're the only ones that can really do that. Everyone else is usually coming from the offshore and raiding and then not staying. 
So we'll move on to battles. And I'm going and again. I'm just briefly going over the rules <clears throat> so that you're not confused when you see certain things happening in the game or after I discuss kind of what occurred in that particular battle round. So we'll be right back talking about battle. Okay, combat in this game is fairly straightforward. You roll one die for each um, military piece, or I guess piece, that you have in the game. So, if I was hitting there, it'd be two. So you'd roll two, two dice, meaning four, fives, and sixes, because Romans hit on that, and I missed, and then the opposing player would get, and they would need a six to hit the Romans, but normally it's a five or six to hit everyone else. Um, and then the defending player can decide if they want to retreat, or they can stay and fight, whatever their choice is. Again, it's fairly straightforward. Um, if you have different kinds of units, like if you have cavalry, as well as infantry, then you'll be rolling dice uh, separately, and then your hits will be um, put on the opponent. And that's basically how it works. Um, so, after the battle is completed, if you're raiding, you can go back to the ocean, otherwise you're the, you're the owner of the territory. Um, but before that, I guess, the attacker can decide, or the defender can decide to retreat, and then after the defender decides to stay or retreat, and the attacker gets that option as well. Leaders give you plus one. Not only do they help you in your movement, <clears throat> but they also give you plus one to attack. So leaders attacking in difficult terrain is one of your best ways of taking that territory. Um, let's see. The Romans make forts, so it's not only do they walk into the territory and blitz, as I said earlier in the game, but they also can create forts. And forts can be used in a couple different ways. First of all, it shows that the Romans have been there when you count your victory points at a certain point in the game. Additionally, if you have connected forts, like let's say you had forts from Sussex all the way up to Lothane. Well, in theory, you could travel from here to here. It's like a highway. It's like they represent the roads as well, intact and good infrastructure all the way up to you know Scotland. But if the, if the forts are destroyed, then the Romans cannot use that way, that method of, of getting up to the, up, you know, <clears throat> they can't use that method. If it's broken, then they have to spend an addition, or a movement point in order to move into that territory. And I'm not going to get into the complexities of if there were a broken line and then it was intact from that point forward, because yes, it appears that you can use that and then you could spend a point and then go back to the next territory and then use the roads. So it is possible. Um, there are three nations in the game that's, or four nations that can submit to Rome, or four cultures that can submit to Rome. The Welsh, the Belgea, the Brigants, and Picts. They can all submit to Roman rule and I think that they have to at some point or they may, they don't have to, but it's kind of a benefit for the play, controlling player because you get to hold on to your territories. Um, but of course, it's a benefit for the for the guy who playing or the the person, I guess I should say, who's playing Rome, because that individual can also obtain victory points from those uh, territories. Um, and then the Saxon bur burrs, which were basically the line of forts that Saxons put up against the. The Danes, in some point uh, in history, they're cheaper to uh, construct, um, but they don't act like the Roman forts or anything. And we will, I'll be right back talking about final thoughts before the game begins. At the end of turns 8 and 9, um, nations can elect kings. Or... I should say, um, <clears throat> cultures can elect kings, and you basically vote for one 
nation to be the king, Breitwalda, I should say, not the king, Breitwalda is what they called it at this point in history, and if uh, whoever gets the majority of votes, if any one nation gets half, I guess it is, they get victory points for it. That's all it really does for them. The king, however, which is on turn 11, 12, 13, and 14, that, if there's a king elected, the person not only gets victory points, but gets troops as well. And at the very last part of the game, turn 14, the Danes uh, can try to really make an influence on England, as they did in history. On turn 16, um, three nations vie for the being king. One of them is the Norwegians, the, da Nor the Normans, and the Saxons, which is what happened in history. And with that, I guess I'll talk a little bit about, I'll show you the side panel which shows you when these nations are coming in. And they give you kind of a breakdown, if I can get the glare off the, off the map. And then I'll start the game and we'll just see how this game flows. Alright, well I really can't get, a, get the glare away, but there's a little sword up here, cardboard sword, and it just shows the turns and it tells you what happens during these turns so like turn one well first of all it gives you at the very top it gives you a date so 40 come on focus geez 45 to 60 AD the Romans invade then uh, Boudicca rebels 60 to 100 AD the Ro some a uh, legion withdraws, some of the legions left. The Irish start invading, Mo I think mostly Wales, but, but Britain. Then you've got from 250 to 340 AD in uh, the Irish, the Scots, the Saxons, the Utes, Angles. Basically, a lot of people start invading uh, Britain. And then tells you uh, turn five, so on. And then you get all the way down to like... The Angles, the Saxons are invading. Every turn, something starts to happen. So most of the most turns, and then the Danes invade around 785. And then you get all the way to the end, which is the Normans, the Norwegians, and the Saxons battle it out for whoever's going to be king of England. And then you basically, at the very end of the game, you figure out which color which is the players have won the game. All right, so without further ado, we're going to start the game. I know I didn't explain all the rules in absolute detail, but I think if you've got the game or if you'd like the way that it looks like it flows, I, I recommend it, by the way. Um, you can get a hold of the game and read the rules yourself. And if I do anything incorrect, uh, please put the notations in the bottom uh, of the video and so other people can play it correctly. I'm not an expert, but I just enjoy the game quite a bit. It's, look, it, it, for the most part, of it feels fairly simple. So let's get started with the Roman invasion of Britain. So this is what it looks like, and I know the yellow is a little bit difficult to see, but this is, the dif uh, this is what it looks like after the Roman turn. The Bilgea and the Brigantes have submitted to Roman rule. So Rome, in the first turn, the yellow player, uh, he goes from essentially Wales, so the east of Wales, all the way north to just past the Scottish border, because I'm counting the Brigantes and the Bilgea as uh, submitted countries. But now Boudicca is going to rise up. We'll be right back. All right. The Belgea have just absolutely come out and have trounced many of the territories that they fought against. They, they failed in South America, but they succeeded in burning the Roman civilization in Suffolk, uh, Essex, and Sussex. And Boudicca was successful in her raid as well. They did not move out of Lindsay or Norfolk. They figured they're going to try to hold on as long as they possibly can because uh, of course the Romans are not going to let this go without without an answer back. 
So now we are going to move on to the turn of the Welch. So the uh, various nations have, have gone, so turn one is over. The reason that that happened was they were very quick turns for everyone. So I wanted to also point out that 18 victory points were scored by blue. And the reason that blue got that is because each Roman army or fort destroyed, they get 6 victory points. So they destroyed 3 Roman forts, so they get 18. Um, and also, uh, the Welsh actually did kill a Roman army on the Roman turn. And, let's see, it's right there. Each Roman army destroyed and fort, 2 and 6. But the Welsh did not attack because there are too many Roman troops defending the fort line on the west side of England, so they did not attack. Bergants just, uh, they got half their population gain, so they were able um, to only get three points, so they just held on to the area of Galloway. They have actually true, two uh, civilization pieces or troops there. The Picts, on the other hand, they pulled out of Dun Dunedin, and Dunedin, I guess it is, and then they moved up with two troops into uh, Kethness, and they forced the, uh, the, the Caledonians to retreat to the Orkies. So, Caldea has retreated. They can't keep up with the population of the Picts yet, so they're hoping that the Romans will put pressure on them. And so we're moving into turn two. Turn two is uh, 60 to 100 AD. And Roman uh, legions can withdraw at this time. So we'll take a look at that and we'll be right back. And Rome has taken out the Belgea almost completely. They did fail taking that one troop out in Suffolk, though. They got lucky and took out a Roman legion. However, it doesn't count for victory points because if you read on the card, it says... Or does it? Oh, that's the pick, sorry. So the, this, is, this is the Belgea. And each Roman army... Let's see. Oh, that's round one. So yeah, wait a minute. They do get two victory points for killing a Roman army. The other thing is, is I have not counted the Roman victory points for how far they've uh, walked up England and the uh, the nations that have submitted to them, which are the Pic or P pardon me, the Brigantes and the Belgea prior. So we'll give them victory points here at turn three. Um. But yeah, they put, they took out, they killed, they killed Boudica, which I believe gives them some victory points, which we'll calculate out in a second. And they went all the way up and took Alban. So the Romans have forts and troops. They basically got all, kind of did almost what they did historically, I believe. Okay, we'll be, we'll be back at the end of probably all the rest of the players' turns but perhaps we'll stop and talk about what each nation has done, depending on how significant it is. All right, well, the Welsh had a really good turn. They invaded all across the whole entire zone of the, um, or the, <laughs> the east side, or the west side of England, and their invasions were, every one of them was successful. They didn't lose one guy. So Rome has got a lot to deal with with these Welsh invaders here. Um, they got 24 victory points, 6 points per fort. And they had 2 to begin with, so they're at 26. Alright, sorry about that interruption. Um, the Brigants, um, they just built up they only get half of their production. The Picts basically, uh, they, they got the Roman incursion coming from the south, but they really can't fight them too easily. So they're putting all their uh, pressure and attacks on the Caledonians. And they've taken uh, Hebrides. 
So the Caledones are going to have to uh, deal with this at some point, you would think, because they've been just uh, just mauled by the picks, or they could just hold on to that one territory, I guess, as long as they can, which is the Orkneys. Um, so next turn, I will count the Roman, uh, the yellow victory points. They, uh, the Belgea, by the way, they did take South America's fort, but they died in the process. So Belgea have been removed. They uh, eliminated as a ethnic uh, unit around, which is probably what happened in history, around 60 to 100 A.D. So, but Boudicca did uh, did get some revenge on the Romans for what they did to their her family, but uh, her people are now gone. Roman is just too powerful. So we will return with the beginning of turn three. In turn three, the only thing that happens is the Irish begin to start to invade. So the Irish invade in around 100 to 250 AD, which may cause some uh, some concern for the Welsh, because I believe the Irish come in in the Atlantic Ocean, so they will be coming in over here, and we'll see if they can do anything to the Welsh. So we'll be back after the Romans maybe retake some of their territories. All right, so the Romans, the Romans have finished their turn. I'll count victory points for them in a moment. And uh, they tried to take Del, Del Rada, but they failed. They attacked with two, and the Picts happened to kill one Roman legion. So the Romans retreated uh, back to their forts to defend it. So we'll see what the Picts do about that. They also uh, made some inroads into Welsh territory by taking the Pyrenees. Poise, pardon me, Poise. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, and they took out many of the uh, Welsh troops. However, some Welshers, Welsh landers, retreated. Like the, this guy retreated to Clyde, and this guy retreated to Gwent from Heiss. So they pushed him out of England, but uh, they're still a force to be reckoned with against the Romans. And you can see lots of Roman forts have been destroyed by the Belgea and uh, and also the uh, the Welsh. The Welsh did they killed four forts, in fact. So, all right, we'll be back after um, depending on how significant the turns are for the next few nations or civilizations. All right, so. The Welsh, again, went across the border and raided <laughs> and uh, destroyed a fort. They also went up into Cumbria and they destroyed another fort. But then the Brigants came down to help their Roman overlords and took out one Welsh lander, or Welsh, and the Welsh had to retreat to, I think this is Cheshire right here. So the, the Welsh moved back to Cheshire, which was unoccupied. The Picts decided not to attack any of the Roman positions. They instead attacked Chaldea and the Orkneys, and they attacked with two, and they lost one. So they retreated back to uh, Cath uh, Cathness. I'm pronouncing all this wrong because I don't know Gaelic. And a lot of the words are difficult for me to figure out their pronunciation, but I'm trying my best. I hope people can appreciate that at, their, at the very least. Um, and uh, the other thing that happened was the Irish did a raid on this territory here, uh, Gwynedd, Gwyn Gwyn and they, um, they killed the Welsh person there but then they died in the process. So that is where we end turn number three. Okay, so now we're going to move on to turn four. 
Turn 4 is from the period of 250 to 340 AD. So the Picts can raid now. The Chaldeans have boats so they can actually maybe get around and get some other territory instead of getting stuck fighting the Picts the whole time. Get, I basically getting punished by the Picts. The Irish, uh, they will have a couple raiders coming in. The Scots will uh, came from Northern Ireland and they'll have a couple raiders. The Saxons show up raiding in the English Channel, the Utes raiding in the English Channel, and the Angles raiding in the North Sea. So uh, Rome and any of the nations are going to be facing quite, a, quite an invasion from this period of time, 250 to 340 AD. About 90 years is when this next turn will take place. So we'll go on to the Roman turn Four. So I also wanted to discuss the victory points. So because of the way that Rome works, uh, if they get a lot of territory, then they can get quite a few victory points. Right now they have 63. And if you look at the uh, blue, They've obtained, uh, let's see, 24. And Green has obtained 30, 40. Green's done quite well, especially with uh, the Welsh. And Red only has two. But they haven't got their primary power in, which is the Saxons. So here are all these forces coming in from different angles of Rome, of, of Britain, I shouldn't say Rome. And so we are moving on to this turn, turn four, which is, as I said before, or did I not? No. This is, yeah, 250 to 340. So this turn, a lot, this turn represents 90 years. So we will move on to the Roman turn. All right. We finished turn four. Um, the uh, the Romans basically they looked at all their reinforcements. I mean their victory points, and they get quite a few uh, for holding like York and a lot of these other territories. Not so much up here. They've already got what they could out of there, so they pulled back. They pulled back down into the southern portion of England, and. Um, they left some territories that were held by forts unoccupied and that's where all these raiders hit you know they hit the downlands they hit kent uh, the uh, angles attacked lindsay and burned as many forts as they could because that's where the raiders get a lot of victory points the irish attacked and and killed the one welsh in cheshire um, and so you can see that the, the Romans are trying to hold on because <clears throat> on turn 5 is when they'll get the, their other victory points. They get to count at that point. The Picts st stopped pressuring the Caledonians and instead uh, they took advantage of the Roman withdrawal from Scotland and took uh, Dundian out and killed the Roman fort in the process. So that's where we are. Now we're moving on to turn 5, which was 340 to 430 AD. So uh, there's still a bunch of raiders as there was the previous turn. Uh, there's still a significant amount of raiding going on. And then most, most of these nations are then going to have to try to start settling. So we'll be back during or after turn five, depending on how eventful it is. All right, we have finished turn five. So what happened? Well, the Romans uh, went to the most important locations, as many as they could, and tried to hold on. The Utes, Kent was worth, uh, for the Utes, Kent is worth uh, eight victory points, so they really wanted to take that. And then the Saxons went to the uh, the other side of southern England. 
the um, the Welsh took back uh, the peonies. I guess it's poise. I guess sorry, poise. And uh, they destroyed the fort in the process. Got some victory points that way. That one legion was kind of uh, you know isolated, so it really couldn't go anywhere. <clears throat> The, um, the Angles attacked uh, a couple different locations. They attacked Norfolk, or no, I think they attacked Suffolk, and they failed. They settled Lindsay, and they attacked York, and were successful in killing the Legion and the fort there. Uh, the Brigantes, Brigantes they, um, they lost uh, Strath Strathclyde to the Scots and uh, they pretty much holding the center area of uh, northern England. The Picts they um, they just kind of just built up a little bit because the Chaldeans they came roaring out of uh, out of the Orkneys and took the Cathneys. So that's where we ended up at the end of turn five. We are going to now be moving to turn six. Turn six was the time frame of, if I can focus here, maybe. Four thirty to four eighty five AD. And what happens on this turn is the Roman British uh, come as the uh, Romans left. The Chaldeans, the Picts have boats, but nothing else. The Irish, the Scots can still raid, but the Saxons are going to be doing a major invasion. Everyone else has to land. So the Utes and the Angles who've been uh, raiding and going back home, now they're going to have to land. And so that's where we are at the end of turn five, moving on to turn six. This is what it looks like at the beginning of turn six. The Roman British have shown up and the, as the Romans have left the board including all the Roman forts. There's a huge Saxon invasion ready to come in. They're red. A few Utes in this English Channel. Some Irish, some Scots, some Angles. Victory points as of right now. 18 for red. It isn't a whole lot. 106 for yellow, which that's kind of expected because what happens in this game is the Romans start out with a lot of victory points, try to get as many as you can because the rest of the game it's going to be defending that lead. Uh, blue has uh, 50, 68, and green, who's actually done quite well, has 82. So green is in second place, followed by blue, followed by red. But we'll see if the Saxons can turn this all around. And we'll be back at the end of turn six. So, the Roman British basically went after some victory points. And then they were pretty much counterattacked pretty heavily by the Saxon invasion and the Utes. The Saxons also hit the Utes, but the Utes um, defended pretty well. The Angles are just taking over. Uh, unoccupied territories. They did attack the Brigantes a little bit. The Irish were successful in taking Devon from the uh, the Welsh. It was a hard battle though. Two against one and they still lost one. The Scots are establishing themselves in southern Scotland or what will be southern Scotland in the future. And the Chaldeans uh, basically kind of got the the Picts who almost had them eliminated. Uh, they're holding them at bay. So that's where we are at the end of turn six. We'll be more moving on to turn seven, and so I'm going to focus in on turn seven, if it will allow me to. There we go, turn seven, 485 to 560 A.D. This is supposedly the time period when, uh, when Arthur came in. So you've got some... Uh, the Brigantes, Brigantes will also have a leader... And the Irish, the Scots, the Saxons, and the Angles will be bringing more troops in. In fact, the Scots have a major invasion, and the Angles have a major invasion. 
So we'll see how this turn all comes out on turn 7. This is the beginning of turn 7. So Arthur has appeared with his two cavalry. I'll show you what they look like. They're little markers. Just have a horse, that's it. Um, then you have some Angle or Saxons coming in from the Frisian Sea. And then you have a, a major invasion coming from the Angles led by Ida coming in from the North Sea. You got one Irish guy still trying to make a dent in the Welsh power here. And then you have Fergus Moore MacError coming in from the uh, Irish Sea. The Irish or the Scots already have a, um, a position in Scotland, so they're going to probably try to expand that with their leader. So we'll be moving on. And I'll let you know how this all turned out. All right. <clears throat> so ends turn seven. 560 AD. And uh, <clears throat> the Saxons have taken the Utes out of Kent and Sussex. The Irish, well first the Welsh tried to take the Irish out of Devon, they failed, but then the Irish tried to take out the Angles in Cheshire and they failed. So, Irish are probably, as far as uh, in this particular game, not long for this game. The Angles invaded pretty hard. They took the Scots out of Dundon, Dundian, but they failed their attack on the Peonies and were forced back into Bernica. So you can see that the Picts, their nation has been reduced by the uh, invasion of the Scots, who took large chunks two territories. And the Scots still have a little bit of coming in and so do the Angles, but other than that it's going to be a battle for a couple turns on what you see on the board here. So we are moving now into turn 8, 560 to 635 AD. Breitwalda may be elected, so we'll see how that turns out. And uh, yeah, it's an interesting game. So we got angles. You can see the symbols, the axe. Those are the angles. And you got the Scots, who are represented by that figure. And you got the Picts. And you got the Chaldeans. And you got the Brigantes, the Brigants. Through the Welsh and the Saxons. We'll be back at the end of turn eight, let you know how things all turned out. I did forget to mention one interesting event. So what happened was the Downlands had the last of the Roman British. Uh, Arthur appeared with his knights and they all invaded and tried to take Adele out at South America. This is the guy's name, Adele. Right there. Oh, or sorry, I guess it's not a D. Ellie? Ellie? Ailey? Anyway, he tried to take Ailey out, and they rolled horrible, and Ailey wiped out Arthur. So Arthur died in South America in this game. Anyway, back to our game. Here we are at the end of turn eight. So the uh, the Welsh, now that they finally wiped out the Irish and Devon, so now they've got complete control. They did make attacks all over uh, the western portion of England. The only successful one in which they held was in March. The Saxons pushed uh, north against the Angles and were successful in only one place, I think. Maybe they weren't. But anyway, 
The Angles then tried to push south into South America, but were unsuccessful. Uh, the Angles pushed all the way around and attacked Cumbria because they were having trouble with the Brigants, and, uh, and now the Brigants are you know, held off in the Peonies and Galloway. The Scots did take out the Picts in the Hebrides, and the Picts are down to three territories, but they've got quite a bit of power still with quite a few guys. So, All right. That's the last of turn eight to let you know kind of where the victory points and the end of turn eight. We've got 32 for red, which isn't a whole lot. 114 for uh, cats. <laughs> 114 for for the uh, for yellow. Green has uh, 82, and blue has 68. So it's yellow, green, blue, and then red holding up the very tail end of it. We are moving on. Oh, wait, uh, Rietwalde was elected, and it's the Saxons who elected them. So the Saxons at least got a few victory points that fashion. We'll now be moving on to turn 9. Rietwalde may be elected again. <clears throat> this is the time frame. Come on, focus. There you go, there you go. Keep trying. Wow. Doesn't like that, does it? Now this auto effect focus isn't doing so good. So it is 6.35 to 7.80, I believe. That was where we were. We're going to turn 9. Turn 9 is 6. Oh, well, yeah, I read it right, 6.80. Oh, there is some more Irish still uh, coming in. All right. And then Breitwalda can be elected again. Just like the pre-king of England. It's just for England itself. Not Wales, not Scotland. Alright, we'll be ret returning at the end of that turn. We are at the end of turn 9. And a few things happened here. First, the Welsh, uh, they pushed hard for York because they get lots of victory points if they can hold it uh, this next turn. The Saxons continue to push back at the Welsh but also put, tried to push the Angles out of uh, England <laughs> or at least the southern portion. And they were successful and then the Angles tried to fight back both against the Welsh and against the, uh, the Saxons and they failed every place they attacked. So the Angles are actually not doing very well at all <clears throat> just because of the rolls. The Irish did take out um, a Welsh in Gwyn Gwynedd, but I don't think there's any more Irish coming in, so the Welsh will just walk right back in there. The um, Caledonians decided to attack the Picts because they were weaker, so they attacked them. They took Skye, but then the Picts, the, uh, the Scots, I mean, but then the Picts decided to attack the Caledonians. They're, they're, uh, uh, mortal enemy, I guess, historical enemy, <laughs> and they took the Cathness, Kate Cathness back. So that's where we are. The Saxons did uh, get elected Breitwalda again, so they got four more victory points for that. And now we are moving on to the uh, tenth turn, I believe, or it's the yeah, it's the tenth turn, seven ten to seven eighty five A.D. So. There's really not much going on here. <clears throat> we'll be back at the end of that turn. Here we are, going into turn 11, so turn 10 has finished. The Saxons, of course, were elected Breitwalda again. Um, huh. Well, it didn't really do so well for the Angles. They keep trying to take 
York back and they have failed every time. The uh, Brigants are spreading out to the north a little bit, back to their, some of their original territories. The Picts got defeated. The Ca uh, Caledonians took them out, but then so the Picts just said fine and they walked a guy into sky because the Caledonians left that unoccupied. Victory points. We've got uh, the red is caught up quite a bit, so 50, 80, 90. Uh, still, they're behind 114 for yellow. So, but red's caught up quite a bit. Um, green, 50, uh, 75, 80, 94. So, red and green are really close. And blue, 50, 60, or 50, 65, 68. Blue has not done so well. Although I think that. Uh, I don't know if I counted their victory points, so we'll count their victory points, and the next time you see it, it might be a little bit more. All right, we are moving on to 785 to 860. The Norsemen coming from the Icelandic Sea, and the Danes are invading from two different, the North Sea and the Frasian. So there's your major invasion from the Norsemen. They really want to take these three territories right here in the north end of Scotland. Those are worth the most victory points for them. And then here are your Danes coming in. All right, we will be back. And a king can be elected this turn, so the King of England may, may appear. And we are now moving on to turn 11. All right, I corrected the, uh, re, or the uh, victory points. So red was the only one that counted. That's why they look so good. I guess they gathered quite a bit last that last time. So here's what we're actually at. 90. Uh, 115, 122 for yellow. Yellow, the only thing that yellow has right now are the three Scots. And then green, 130. So green's actually ahead in the game right now. And blue, 90. So actually blue and red are tied. Now, <laughs> you can see that I removed some, um, some pieces. Basically the Saxons have all of southern England now. The Welsh are in York. The Brigants retreated because the Danes invaded the whole coastline and um, they invaded one place where the Brigants were and the Brigants just retreated and allowed the Danes to to raid it. Um, same with the Saxons, they retreated. The Danes did kill the last Angle in Bernica, so he's gone. Um, I don't think the Norsemen got to go, so we'll have to go with the Norsemen. So it'll look a little different uh, the next turn. So the Norsemen haven't gone yet. I skipped them and went right to the Danes. Okay, they're not going to impact each other. Uh, there could be some more red victory points that might pop up, though. And the king will be elected by red, so red will get some more victory points that way. So we're now moving on to turn 12 after the Norsemen go 860 to 935 AD the uh, Norsemen have some more invaders the D Dubliners come in to try to uh, do some raiding and the Danes have a major inv invasion and Alfred the Saxon leader there was a Saxon leader El Egbert but he never really needed to be put on the board because the Saxons didn't do anything but just take unoccupied territories so we'll go with the Norsemen then we'll go with them again. I mean, during their turn, of course. All right. There's your little amendment. The uh, the Norsemen were able to take the Orkneys, but they were not able to take the northern Scottish territory. There, they retreated back to the sea. They got three victory points for taking the Orkneys. All right. Next, you'll see the regular turn with no misses. I hope. 
And here's where the turn ended for turn 12, 935 AD. So the Saxons still hold on to quite a bit of England. Nobody became king because there just wasn't enough. The um, Avar basically took North America. The Saxons hold South America. And they built some of these forts uh, from the downlands all the way up. Alfred's been holding up in the downlands. So the Vikings, or the Danes, actually did take Suffolk. Yeah, but the uh, they take they took it back. The Saxons did. There were some raids over on this coast here, uh, but both sides died. And the uh, the Welsh came out and took March, but it was taken back by the Saxons. The Dubliners took Cum Cumbria, and they just decided to hold on to it. Nobody tried to take it back. Br the Brigants, who who basically have been here since the beginning of the game. They're holding, again, Galloway and the Peonies. And then, of course, you've got the Danes all the way on the, uh, on the east coast. Uh, the Scots are holding on. The uh, Norsemen tried to take the Scots out of uh, the Hebrides, but they failed to do so. And the Picts are holding on up there with three territories. So as far as uh, invaders, we still have a Norseman in the ocean or in the sea. We've got a in major invasion coming from the Dubliners. We've got a Norseman in the, uh, in the Atlantic. And uh, we've got some Danes coming in from the North Sea. And that is it. So this is, uh, we'll go on to the victory points real quick. So we've got uh, 80, 90... 99 for the red, 115, 22 for yellow. So green's been doing really well with victory points. They're at 150, 62. That's going to be quite a bit to try to catch up to. And we've got uh, 90 for blue. And blue really only has one major power left, or one power left, and that's the picks. But green and red are battling it out for the moment over England. We'll be back when we finish this turn, which is... No, oh, we covered it up. 935 to 985 AD. Uh, this is a scoring round got the Dubliners, uh, they have a major invasion, and only got three more turns after that before the game is over. We'll be right back. This is what it looked like at the end of turn 13. So the Saxons uh, put a couple more forts and they pushed the Danes out of Suffolk and North America. The uh, Norsemen were able to land and defied. The uh, Dubliners took York, but then the Danes took it back. So the Danes really focused on taking York. Um, this, there was a lot of battle going on here. So the um, Caledonians took uh, the Norsemen out of the Orkneys. Then the Picts attacked the Caledonians, their longtime enemy in Cath. Caithness, and they lost. Um, the Norsemen uh, tried to attack the Hebrides and failed. So Scotland still has like every color possible in it right now. And we are now going to move on to the next turn, but let's look at the victory points. 130, 140, 147 for red. 140. 40, 35 for yellow, so we're pretty close to, between those two. Green, I gotta imagine, it's got a lot. 100, 210. Yeah, green's running away with this game. And blue, which lost its major power, the Anglos, because they didn't roll very well, have 75, 80, 90, 102, like half of what green has. But it's just a fun game. 
there's been no, uh, let's see, oh, there is a king, and it's the red guys, so the red, we can add another eight victory points and a troop, because they were able to elect the king of England, but we are moving on to 785 to 1035, there's still some Danes coming in, but they have to remove quite a bit after they come in. Dubliners are still invading the east coast of the west coast of England. So we will return after turn 14. Okay, no king was elected this turn. The Danes and the Saxons basically hold the exact same number of territories. So Danes invaded with uh, Canute and he took Essex and Kent and then he also took North Mer Mercia back. However, four of the of the troops left so they only have doubled up in York. And then the Saxons tried to take Essex and Kent back but failed both times so that's where we ended up. The Welsh did take back Defied from the Norsemen. So the only territory the Norsemen have remaining is Skye. Uh, the Scots still hold a couple territories, the Caledonians do, and so do the Picts. And the Brigantes basically have held these two territories through the entire game. The Dub Dubliners tried to take the Peonies but failed, so they retreated back. And that's where we are. Uh, we are now moving on to turn 15. This is... Eight or 1035 to 1066. So here's where the Normans invade to try to conquer England. Um, there's one turn after that to settle all matters. So we will be back at the end of turn 15. All right, we've got a little bit of finagling, moving around going on here. So let's see what happened. The Welsh didn't do anything. They just built up their frontier. The, um, the Danes did try to make a couple of attacks, mostly counterattacks. You can see that they don't have a whole lot left. Got some east coast uh, territories remaining. The, um, let's see, the Dubliners didn't do anything. Brigantes didn't do anything. Caledonians, Norsemen, Scotsmen didn't do anything. They all held where they are. But the Scots did try to take uh, Dunedin, but they failed. But they did take out the Dane that was there, so that at least was beneficial for them. The Norwegians attacked south, trying to get York, North America, March. Then the Saxons came up and attacked um, Her Her Olaf in uh, March, we drove him off. Then the Normans drove up through a major invasion and attacked the Saxons in March and drove the Saxons back, Harold back to Heiss. And that's where we ended up. So now we are moving on to the last turn. Will there be a king? We'll soon find out. All right, here we are in turn 15, turn 16. This is the last turn of the game. Um, so before I go on with the last turn, it is 1066 to 1083. Let's go over the victory points just to see if anybody is even close. 130, 145, 147. That's what I believe it's at. 160, so we're pretty close. I mean, 147, 160, with that's 13 points difference. But here we got 100, 210. That's going to be almost impossible to catch, I think. That's 110, 20, 26, 126. Blues come up a bit, but still, that's not in the realm of possibilities, I don't think. So we will return after the um, turn 16, the last turn. 
It's been a very interesting game. All right, that's the end of the game. So essentially what happened was Harold Haralda of the Norwegians attacked William in the march and completely lost like amazingly bad. Didn't even get one hit. Then the Saxons marched north and did very well, incredibly well with infantry versus cavalry and uh, completely destroyed William the Conqueror. So the Saxons won there. And then the Danes came in. Well, the Danes came in earlier and uh, tried to get into the mix but couldn't quite make it. And so the way that the game is discussed is there's no king. England doesn't have a king. You've got the Danes uh, still fighting the Saxons essentially for <laughs> the kingship of. England. As far as like how everything looks, well Wales is completely owned by the Welsh. They had a few invasions but they were able to always take it back. The Romans really didn't put much pressure on them because they were going north. Maybe it's better if the, if the uh, Romans put some pressure on the Welsh to keep them in check. That probably is a good idea because later on in the game they just keep racking up victory points. Um, the Saxons hold, held most of England for a long time, but you can see right now you've got some Norman influence in the south, and you've got some Danes still over in the east part of the country, and then you've got the Norwegians up the coast, and the Dubliners in the central portion. And uh, the Scots were able to take uh, most of southern Scotland, and the Brigantes have one unit left in Galloway at the end of the game. The Picts and the Caledonians kept fighting uh, each other throughout the whole entire game. It was pretty fun. Um, but the Caledonians held their own. They were almost annihilated, but they came back and they actually have an equal sized realm as the Picts. Um, the victory points. Let's look at those real quick. So it's 130, 40, 50, 65. 165 for red. That's, yeah, 165. Yellow came in with uh, 175, 185, 186 victory points. So yellow's ahead of uh, red right now. Green stomped everybody with 230, 40, 54. 254. Green did very well. And I think blue might be the last. Let's see. 100, 10, 20, 30, 42, 142. Yeah. So it's basically um, green, yellow, red, and then blue. But blue really got unlucky in the middle part of the game with the Anglos. So how do I feel about this game? Well, you can tell that I like it. I like the way, I like the different cultures, ethnicities. Um, clashing with each other. You can see them on the board. They've got their little, you know, each one of these little nomen nomenclatures or the, I guess, the, the artistic pictures. Each one of them is different depending on the faction. And I mean, they're all pretty cool. And you can see that the ones with the boats are kind of, I think, depicting the Scandinavians. And then the ones with the axes are like the Germanic the people. And then the little gold coin or whatever is the, uh, I'm not sure, it's a I think it's a shield, but that depicts the original inhabitants of, uh, of England, the Celts, I guess. So there are Celts there, the Celts survived in Wales, and the Celts survived up in northern portions of Scotland. And then the, the, the spears... Well, the spears, the I guess I don't know what. Oh, the, okay. So those those are Picts, um, Caledonians, and Scots, and they're all maybe related, I guess, or maybe that's just the. Yeah, I think they might be all all related. I'm not sure. I don't think anything's not represented here. Although the Dubliners have an axe, when I thought the Dubliners were mainly uh, from. 
uh, Scandinavian descent as well. Anyway, it might just be the age in which they're coming in. I'm not sure what the different symbols mean. I guess I should check that out. But anyway, I really do enjoy the game. I like all the the timelines of the history of each one of the Raiders coming in. So that was Britannia that I played. It's just a playthrough, not perfect by any stretch. So, I mean, I'm not trying to claim that this is the best battle report ever. I didn't really explain the rules very well, but I didn't really want to. If you like the game, or if you, li if you like these kinds of games, then you can always get the game and read the rules yourself. But I think they're pretty much accurate for the most part. There might have been a couple little errors here and there. There is another game that I will be playing that is similar to Britannia. And it is in Italy. And it has two phases to it. One of them is, um, I guess, Rome expanding out. So they're dealing with Carthage and the Gauls and the Celts and stuff. Um, and then, there's an, then the second half of it is Rome collapsing, basically, through time the Western Roman Empire collapsing. It's all based on Italy for the most part. I think a little bit of North Africa, and I think that's it. But I'll, I can't remember exactly. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. Uh, we'll be doing another one in the future, and I'll just keep putting some of these games out there. This one is really for three players or four. It's really not for two. It's really not for one. It's for three or four normally. So just keep that in mind if you are looking at a game. It's this is more of a three to four player game. All right, Old Man Sarge signing off. Hope you enjoyed it.